Well, let's assume we're all live and let me introduce everyone. We'll start with Ray, uh, who will tell us about herself in a few minutes, and then AJ MacArthur and Jamie B, Jamie B, and Stephen Pearl. So let's start with Ray. Ray, want to tell us a little about yourself and your books? Yeah, um, I am a children's book author. Um, I have written so far six books. Um, I'm currently having my seventh illustrated right now. Um, the My first book that I released is called Cowgirl Lessons um, and uh, features a little girl and her lesson horse. And um, all three of my horse books are award winning. And um, that's, I just really enjoy what I do. And I'm from California. <laughs> You obviously know horses since you have them right yeah, here. Yeah, um, I've been around horses all my life. Um, my family, both sides, my husband's side and my side. Uh, my daughter is the first one to ride competitively. She rides on an Arabian um, team. And she went last year, um, our show season, of course, was shortened because of COVID. But she did go up to sport horse nationals in Idaho, which was great. And she did really well. And so... Um, that's kind of where our horse life is now, is, is with her and her riding. Thank you. AJ, you have four novels out already, all in mystery and suspense. And yes. I hear you're going to have a new Poochie or old Poochie coming back in one of yours. Want to tell us about your books and yes. your Poochie? Um, I, uh, as you said, I write mystery suspense. Uh, I have four published. Another one is coming out June of this year. I've always had um, a dog at least make the, the last one, the one that's coming out in June, it's, it's pretty much just a cameo appearance, but other novels, they play a, a, a bit bigger role. My, my first novel had uh, a pug in it. His name was Harley. And um, some of the reviews came out, people would say, they would mention him specifically, that they liked Harley as a character. So my current work in progress that, is very early on in the uh, in the progress department. It features that will Harley will be coming back as a character, and he actually in the first novel he actually had a hand in in helping to solve the crime. But I like I like having dogs specifically, but uh, I love animals of any kind. But uh, so far I've just had dogs featured in the novels. I live uh, Sounds I live just north of Quebec City, Canada. So uh, all of my novels so far have been set in Canada. Sounds interesting. Ooh. Jamie, I know you're a real animal person because you tell me you were a zookeeper. Yeah. <laughs> and you're from Florida like I am, so you're, you're probably having some of the same rainy weather I'm having. Yeah, Hopefully it's been drizzly all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us about your books. Um, so I have my debut novel coming out um, spring of this year. Um, it's an Congrats. adventure thriller. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, set in the Amazon rainforest, um, based on my experiences hiking there, um, spending time uh, in the jungle. And so uh, because of my background as a zookeeper, I can't not put a bunch of animals in my book. So I don't have a main animal character, but I do have a lot of different exotic animals that the characters come across on their journey. Um, yeah. Thank and you. I'm located over by Disney in Florida, so Central Florida area. <laughs> of course. We'll really ignore Disney now and think about the zoo instead. Yeah. Steven, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I see you Steve. have cats in your book. Yep. Uh, Stephen B. Pearl, the B makes it easy to find me on the internet. And the work that I do, have done most with it, with animals, is cats. It's a cyberpunk romantic comedy involving felines. And a group of people go into a game, get trapped there, and are turned into cats. Um, <laughs> wow. I also have um, cat, a cat who's a major character in my Chronicles of Ray McAndrews series. That's uh, urban fantasy. And Ray McAndrews is a wizard, and his familiar, Sekma Ra, saves his bacon on more than one occasion. Uh, and... She's quite an interesting uh, little one, and she's actually based on a uh, cat that I had for many, many years. So that sounds familiar. Yeah. That's, well, she is, and it is. 
<laughs> That's sort of like in my book, my my Dixie here, if you will, oh. Francis Gutierrez. That's Dixie. And she's sort of the inspiration for mine, who is sort of not a familiar exactly, but my main character has this cat, and she knows she's psychic. And anybody who's had cats know they are psychic, and I can mm -hmm. prove it. All you've got to do is bring out the flea medicine to put on their necks or something they don't want. You don't have to say a word. They run. Mine, they know it if I'm bringing it out. And Dixie in my book uh, sort of tries to tell us sometimes, like, Casey, don't go out. Casey, stay home. And Casey doesn't listen. She says, I don't speak cat. And she should. But she's just an ordinary real estate uh, property manager in St. Augustine. And she has these tenants that she might like to murder, but she really doesn't. And they get murdered, and it gets very complicated. So my cat kind of moves the story. And in one, one of my books, well, we're gonna get, well, I'll tell you this, and then we'll ask yours, too. In moving my plot, I had a spot where I'm putting my character, Dixie, I mean, I'm sorry, Casey, my main character, is in a hotel room. And these two people, bad guys, a guy and a woman who were, Actually, she's the sister of a tenant, and they're holding the gun on. And she had, doesn't know until that moment that they're the bad guys, and they're going to take her off and kill her. And she's stuck in a hotel room waiting for her breakfast to arrive. Uh, Dixie, she had to bring Dixie with her because her ex-husband refused to mind him that day, her that day. So Dixie's sitting perched up on top of the, the TV cabinet where the TV is in the hotel room. The two people are holding the gun. They haven't even noticed Dixie. Uh, the room server comes in to bring her food. When he sits to breakfast, goes to take the breakfast and put it on the table, Dixie just saves her life, jumps, knocks the plate. The hot tea goes in one person's face, the oatmeal in the other one. Dixie, the server, and Casey all run out of the room. And that's one of the ways Dixie's moved my, my book forward. So I'd like to ask, starting again with Ray, how your animal characters have moved your book or your plot, or have they? Well, I think they at least the horse books they do because they're they're really about the interconnection of the kids and the horses. So um, they do kind of play that role. Um, if I think about like Cowgirl and the Ghost Horse, that one is really the girl is going along on this adventure and she's trying to find the legendary ghost horse. And so the whole story is her going on this adventure and the ghost horse is following her along and she doesn't know anything and it gets to the end and it's really, she's telling a ghost story and the ghost is actually her pony, her horse. So kind of moves it along in that direction. Yeah, it definitely does. AJ, how about you? Um, well, like I said, uh, most of, in, in only my first book, the the character Harley the pug did did move the plot along because he was uh, he helped to to solve the the mystery. Uh, hopefully, in my next one, he'll he'll take a major role there too. What I find, uh, I don't use some cats are different, but with dogs, it's not quite the same. I, I don't think the, to have them to be uh, to work as familiars, and and I don't I don't write fantasy. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I find it, it, it gives you an insight into the characters. If you want to have an evil character, you can always have that character be unkind to animals. And that's, that will tell you everything about their character. Right. And inversely, right. if you want to, to make your own character seem more human, more empathetic, kinder, you have them be kind to animals and that uh, that helps you build their build the character and that's how i like to use the uh, the animals in my book is to help that's an excellent character. point because i i did similar to that in one of my books i'll tell you that later though jamie how about you uh for me i use them as um a way to create suspense between so there's uh scenes where the characters run into caiman which are um, a South American uh, crocodilian. Um, they run into monkeys, porcupines, um, different kinds of birds. And so for me, I used it to either create a sense of um, awe in the environment um, and make it just seem that even more remote and um, 
outside of what you would normally be exposed to um, for the characters, and then also to create a bit of suspense and fear in encountering things that are dangerous and unknown. Um, because the my characters are graduate students um, going on a research trip and they get stranded out in the jungle. Um, so they're kind of coming up against all these different things that uh, you wouldn't experience out on a college campus. Uh, you don't really run into crocodiles out there. So. <laughs> and it's probably a good way in, to kind of educate people about what different animals live where and what their habits are too. For so. sure, most definitely. Stephen, now yours is kind of a different genre. Of course, you do so many genres. So, how do you use well, your animals? Well, in uh, Nuki Kubai, actually, that's the paranormal action adventure. Uh, there is one scene where Ray has gone astral and he's hunting for the Nuki Kubai on the astral plane with the hopes of finding its, his way back to the physical so he can uh, take the battle to the Nuki Kubai. And because of the astral flows, he gets sucked, in, sucked into the realm of the goddess of the Nuki Kubai, and he's being pasted. It's basically he has fought as hard as he possibly can. He's got nothing left. And Sekma Ra, his cat, senses that he's on the verge of death, and she astral projects into the scene and takes on the form of something the size of a Siberian tiger and lays into the goddess of the Nuki Kubai, uh, distracting her long enough that Ray is able to escape and they were both able to get out of there. Uh, she's more she's more an active partner in his adventures mm -hmm. than a pet, but she's an active partner with the real attitude of, you know what, you do what you like, and if you get fried, you get fried. I won't show up until you are about to be dead because you fill my food. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's a big thing with cats. I mean, if they, if the person that's filling their food dish isn't around, they're in trouble. That's why they keep us. Yes. And they definitely do keep us. <laughs> oh, yes. And they train us. Cat training is all from their point of view, not ours, I'm sure. Anybody who's had a cat knows that one. <laughs> Dogs, you can train them. I mean, they they want to make you happy. But cats, horses, I don't think care too much one way or the other if you're happy. But oh, uh, they do care. If you miss their feeding time, man, they will let you know. <laughs> oh yes, but they, as long as they're happy is the point. Right. <laughs> they're feeding. I mean, they're not too concerned about your feeding. No. I yeah. Yeah. In other, other books that you've read, they say, has there been an inspiration somewhere that you've read a book that had a character that really, you know, kind of kind of motivated you to put a character uh, animal in your books? Again, let's start with Ray. Um, I, I just knew when I started writing that, and what I was writing, I needed the animal to be part of my book. Mm -hmm. um, I did write one book that's not in the horse series it's called beach day and um it wasn't really i was inspired by another book it's i i was inspired again by the, the um, connection of my daughter and our dog so they have their adventure on the beach together so that's really where most of my inspiration comes from activities in life rather than other books i read good point aj um, I can't say I was inspired by any other books. Just it, it, it's just there that I want to. I want to have an animal involved in the book. I find it 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 adds character. It adds humor. You can use the animal to to you know just the the cuteness level can add something to your to your story. Lighten it up. As uh, I think it was Jamie said, you know, adding suspense to your to your mm -hmm. stories that that I in in a couple of the books you know it, it was um there were some some points where the where the dogs were in danger and I always find it funny because uh, people will will you know it doesn't matter if humans are murdered or or injured uh -huh. or anything, but don't don't hurt the dog 
you know, they'll say, <laughs> oh my God, I was so worried about the dog and I had to flip, flip, flip ahead to make sure the dog was going to be okay. So you know, <laughs> I, find, I find that funny, but it, it, it adds a different dimension just to have that, that pet in there. And, uh, you know, yes, I've seen it. I can't say specifically which ones, but yes, I've seen it in other novels that people will use animals, uh, any type of animals, horses or, or cats or dogs to, to add, to add a different dimension to the story. So that's why I think it's, uh, it's important. It's important to, for me anyway, it's important to give it a, a different, a different level at certain points to, to ease up the tension perhaps, or to make, to, to increase the tension depending on, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what you're looking for. That uh, makes a good point because I use that in, this is a, another novel that I'd written a while back and it's a series and it's set during the Civil War. It's my War in the West series. And it's a, it's set Kansas, Missouri mostly, but it, it comes out of there a little bit. But my bad guy in the movie is based on a real life person, Jim Lane, who was a politician kind of uns very unscrupulous. If anybody has seen the um, Clint Eastwood movie, uh, The Outlaw Josie Wales, the guy in the beginning of the movie that has uh, gorillas, you know, they surrender and they had some all killed, that's him. So I couldn't find, couldn't create a worse guy than this guy, so I used him. Well, in my story, I have a Southern guy who's come, escaped from, come from the South because he's found out his father and has been having an affair with the slave and his half brother who was his slave. He frees them. They go up there to Kansas to settle. And he's he's against slavery at this point. He's, you know, he, but he's still Southern, but he's, you know, he's up there with his former slave brother. Uh, he ends up going to Lawrence trying to find out what John Brown's up to. Uh, gets his life saved by this Massachusetts abolitionist young woman who's up there. She's off and her father's been killed. They come back. He said, well, they, we, he can't, she can't go back to Lawrence. So they have to get married. And they have to be, you know, he's got to do something to help her. So they get married, which isn't a romance thing. It's just a necessity in the time. Uh, while they're together, so just starting off, they find these two young puppies who John Brown had killed the owner and the owner moves and they go on their land. They find these two puppies and they name them Mason and Dixon. And as the story moves into the second book, and of course they love the dogs, and they, their union becomes a romance. And she's pregnant, he's off doing something, buying things, and the bad guy comes by. Well, he's been raping people, murdering people, burning houses down, really bad guy. Kill, kicks her, makes her lose her baby, but he shoots the dogs. And when he does that, that's when people really know what a really bad guy he is. So I really take your point on that one. But getting back into the same thing, uh, Jamie, how about you? Um, for me, it was no question whether or not I would include animals just because that's my entire life and career. But yeah. um, I was inspired a lot by, um, I love Michael Crichton and James Rollins' um, adventure books um, and Michael Crichton's mm -hmm. science fiction thrillers and techno thrillers. And almost all of those books have some kind of animal piece in there. Um, and I always enjoyed reading them as somebody who works with animals as a profession. Anytime I can find animal pieces in a book, I'm always um, hyper scrupulous mm -hmm. in how it's treated. And I've always enjoyed their takes on including animals and how they help further the plot and uh, keep the tension or suspense and things like that. So um, given the fact that that's mostly what I read, it was easy to kind of draw on that inspiration and know that I could use it for the same things and just tweak it for my kind of experience. Yeah. Stephen, how about you? Uh, I don't, <clears throat> sorry, I don't really draw a lot of inspiration for having animals in my books for from other people, but uh, I will say Jim Butcher does some excellent work on, in that regard with his, uh, in his Harry Dresden, the Dresden Files series. Uh, but I like to include animals because they're wonderful mirrors. They reflect back at us who we are and let us see a, see the character in a deeper light, sort of like your guy, you know, he's really bad when mm -hmm. he shoots the dogs. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's anything more reprehensible than somebody who, 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 who abuses an animal 
because they come into your home, they trust you, they love you, and then you're betraying that. And it's a form of betrayal, I think, that's even worse than the only thing that's on par I can think of is betraying a child. Because they're mm -hmm. in that same sort of dynamic of they are powerless. They may be clever, they may be manipulative, but ultimately we, uh, we have complete power over them. And uh, you have to, it's a true test of your moral character, how you act in that situation. So I think that it says so much about somebody that they have a pet specifically or that they're kind to animals in general. My, my dick's sneezing a bit there. She does that sometimes. Um, I'd like to open it up now. Anybody have any suggestions that they'd like to say about either putting an animal in a book or why your animals are in the book? Open okay, it up well, anybody. I can start and maybe we can riff on it. Um, okay. Using animals, <clears throat> I think when you use an animal, you really have to stay true to its nature. Don't make it a person that just happens to be furry. Mm -hmm. Because I know specifically with cats, they view the world very differently than humans do. And there are some commonalities, but they're on the, you know, they're out there. Uh, and trying to figure them out is the work of a lifetime. And uh, that's something I really try to incorporate with Sek Mara in the uh, in Nuki Kubai, that she has a very different view of everything than Ray does. And I'm wondering how you uh, you other folks deal with that. Any suggestions? Yeah, I, I agree that you you uh, you have to stay true to to the character and even within within at like within dog breeds i've used different breeds uh as i said harley's a pug i've had a golden retriever i've had a german shepherd and i have had a black lab they also have different characters you know the golden retrievers are 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 very uh, gentle and calm uh very loving pugs also but pugs can also be they have a a stubborn side and they have a, a different different character so i try to stay true to the breeds within within the the, the dogs um and i agree with with cats also any type of animal jamie it must be quite a challenge to when you're dealing with so many different kinds of exotic animals to but of course you you work with them so you, you know you, you know them, but still you, you're dealing with a lot more than, than cats or dogs um, and, and Ray with the, the horses. But yes, I definitely agree that you have to, you have to stay true. You can't, you can't uh, go too far off the rails with, uh, with those characters. I know um, in the book I wrote, Beach Days, um, I have gotten comments from people who have read it who really like the story, but then they're concerned because there's this one section of the story where the family is watching fireworks and they're like, that dog would never sit there. Well, I've had a really weird dog that liked fireworks, you know? And it's like this, I, and I, you know, I usually respond with, I, I mean, most dogs wouldn't like fireworks, most dogs wouldn't sit there. But there are dogs, I mean, especially in the hunting breed, they're used to the loud noises and stuff. And so um, th that could happen, actually. But um, even truly with horses and stuff, I try, you know, I don't have them doing things that horses wouldn't do. And, and so you do really try to stick with what would an animal do when, when you're riding and when I'm riding. That's a good point. I had a, my little dog was terrified of fireworks. He hated them. Uh, most of my cats, when people start shooting fireworks or anything, they'll come running in, but I've got some that don't. I've got one cat, most cats are picky eaters. I've got one cat, I mean, I, it actually eats avocados. Anything, anything we eat. It, it got named Hungry. It was originally Queen Isabel, but it, the name got changed to Hungry for good reason. So yeah, you've got, 
personality differences. I mean, anything that we would eat, it will eat. But I've had a couple who are adore muffins. <laughs> you can't have a muffin in this house without sharing it. <laughs> and they let you know when they want some too. Mm -hmm. I think any animal will do that pretty much. Yeah. Now, Jamie, you you work so much with the exotic animals. What can you tell us about what's really unusual about some of those animals? Um, it's a good question. They're surprisingly not. So I work um with primates and big cats. Um, so tigers, gorillas, um, different types of small apes and monkeys and things like that, as well as some of the smaller mammals. Um, but I always tell people, you know, especially with things like the big cats, like the tigers and the cougars, that, you know, a cat is a cat is a cat. Um, they're just apex predator cats <laughs> as opposed to house cats. But um, behavior minus some of the more species-specific things are all incredibly similar. So if once you narrow cat behavior down, it's pretty easy to pick up on all the different cat behaviors from domestic cats. I have four domestic cats. Um, I have four cats at home. They've been pounding on the door since I locked myself in here for this. Um, <laughs> That's so, what you're doing, cat. You could have let them in. Oh, no, they just be everywhere, everywhere. They need to be the cent center of attention, my cats. Um, uh, but then same thing with primates, um, a lot more intellectually focused. Uh, they're incredibly bright, incredibly smart. So adding anything like that, you know, you have that mischievous factor as well, where they're really interested in everything everybody's doing. So I have um, squirrel monkeys in my book, and they kind of pop through the canopy and the characters are watching them forage through the leaves and, and watching their behavior and taking the time to really just relate to what's going on around them as opposed to being focused on something specific happening in the story it just kind of allows for a transition of investigation, if you will, which is what kind of primates do anyways. They just investigate everything. So it was fun for me to play on that a little bit with the characters investigating the primates who just go investigate everything as part of their day. Um, but yeah. That's... That would be interesting to, to go. I've read the experiments. I don't remember the particular chimp's name that they actually it had learned to speak a little bit. I mean, sign language. And mm -hmm. at some point it learned how to lie. There was a story, part of the story was, and this was an actual case. The keeper there was a desk or something in there in the cage with the primate and it turned it over, upset it, broke it or something. And when they came in the next day and they asked her, it's sign language said Kate, which was a helper, Kate did it, I didn't do it. So they said that, that was a highly humanistic behavior for a primate to have able to, because apparently lying is a very human factor and that for the primate to be able to able to tell a lie, displace time and things like that, that it showed a very high level of intelligence. Yeah, very, very, very smart. Very smart, yeah, for sure. Another yeah, factor, so in, sorry, another factor in using animals, I think, is you really need to go into their psychology and their biology in so much as, okay, you take a raccoon, for example, they're far more tactile than they are visual. So if you try to apply human standards to a raccoon, they don't make a heck of a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But if you're applying that thing of, yeah, they're they're touching, they're feeling, and this is where their dominant inputs are coming from, then you can start to understand a lot of the behavior like the washing the food and uh, pawing around in the stream and you know, looking for crayfish, of course, but you know they're working by by touch as opposed to sight. And if you're going to do the animal realistically, it's really a matter of learning a little bit about how they are perceiving the world, like exactly what level of colorblindness does the cat have. And so if you're going to, I think they're blue-green colorblind, if memory serves. And so you don't put something blue on top of something green and expect it to stand out for the cat. Mm -hmm. uh, and just 
research like that really helps bring a book to life when you're doing it and helps them to enhance your animal character. That's a good point because if you, you know if you make a scene where the cat sees something blue or sees something green that normally they wouldn't recognize the color and you have them recognize it, it would come for somebody who really knew what they were talking about, it would come to that's not so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I was just going to say when I was working with my illustrator, um, and it's it's we're really trying to be particular about, or at least I am, about you know what the horse looks like and everything like that. And the very first time he drew for me, the horse's legs were backward, you know, like how they bend. And I kept looking at it going, what is the matter with this thing? And then it, it dawns on me that he drew the legs, so it was a back, back of a horse's legs bend forward versus backward, and he had them turned around. So but just making sure that you are presenting that animal, at least in illustration, truly um, is something that, in, in my world of writing, that I have to be, pay attention to. Yeah. Interesting. Good point. Such a little detail that the average person wouldn't even think of, but it's important because you know mm -hmm. that about the horse. And some reader's going to know it too if, if you make that right. mistake. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, another one of the tropes that has crept into a lot of fiction that drives me is having animals being fighting each other and being vicious when the reality is. A wild animal will try to avoid a fight because they realize if they get injured, that can be fatal because mm -hmm. they don't have a house to go back to. They don't have medical care. So it's really counterproductive from a survival standpoint to be overly vicious. There are exceptions, and you get occasional individuals because animals are individuals who are just jerks. But, yeah, just like people. Yeah, just like people. You know, uh, we had a big black tom wander in my neighborhood a couple of years ago, and it would attack anything going until such time as it went after one of my cats who was in the backyard in the on a leash, and I got wind of it, and then it realized it was about to die. Uh oh, <laughs> it outran me. It outran me, and then it left the neighborhood. <laughs> well, that's funny. You know, in feral cat colonies, there's always the one we call Tough Tom. And mm -hmm. it's it's a mean cat in a way, in that it won't let, like when I adopted Dixie, Dixie, somebody had dumped her. She was a little five pound kitten. And somebody had dumped her, minus her mama, just her out there in a colony, an established feral colony behind a grocery store. And the Tough Tom, who was heading that, wouldn't let her come up and eat, which it sounds terrible, but it's the survival of the colony because mm -hmm. if anything could come in and eat, then there wouldn't be enough food for them. So, you know, people would come out and feed them. The tough Tom, that's his job. But the funniest thing was we had one we took in, and I wrote a story about this. It was never a book, but excuse me. Uh, we called it Garfield because it had a little black mustache. And uh, it was it was the tough Tom. I mean, no other cat would dare put its nose in the food until tough Tom told it was okay. So it was a cold winter day. Somebody called told my ex husband, oh Martin Garfield's limping. So he went out and he brought Garfield home. Well, at the time, I was fostering two little kittens, and I had them locked in the office. I didn't want to leave anybody out because it was one of our cold Florida days when we had a freezing. Don't do it often, but when we do it, we do it. So I had to put Garfield in the office. Within a day, Garfield was out there licking, babying, cuddling those kittens. They would go and get their nose in the food bowl, and he would back up and let them eat. So cats seem to have an understanding of who's a threat and who's, you know, mm -hmm. someone vulnerable that needs their help. We had and one I around here. Mm -hmm. We had one around here called Guest. I, I, I called him Guest. And we do <laughs> feed the ferals. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically fed here for several years and he was the dominant cat in this neighborhood and interestingly enough he was a male cat 
who took an active interest in his offspring and would lead them to food and show them dance and nurture mm. them, uh, which is not typical behavior for male cats, but he did. Um, a funny story, there was this big, uh, big Tom that moved in across the street who was about twice the size of Guest. And it started strutting around the neighborhood. And it made the mistake of going to Guest's food bowl. And Guest <laughs> saw it. Um, Guest pounced on it. There was one dust up. And from that day forward, anytime this big Tomcat saw Guest, it ran in the other direction. <laughs> Dominus had been established. <laughs> yeah, they know. But the interesting thing, the tough Tom, the one that I brought in, the two little kittens were not even his offspring, but yet he mm. adopted them because I guess that was his role in the feral colony was to make sure his colony was safe and being in the room with them, he assumed these were his, and they did the same thing with the second batch of kittens I had too. So okay. I do horses have a dominancy thing? Ray? Uh-oh, I think you got you're, muted. You're, you're, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. You're, Sorry, you're, there was an airplane going over. <laughs> so I was waiting for it to like clear the way so <laughs> it wouldn't okay. be you wouldn't have that sound. What was the question? The horses, do they have a dominancy thing? I guess in wild horses you, you see um, it the moon. Some of them do. Um most of our horses are, you know, they're they're not out together. Um, per se, but you can, there's definitely some mares who are marish and you can't put them together with another horse. So you do have to figure out their personalities. It's just some, just like people, some don't get along with other people. So you, you got to keep yeah, them Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And then there are some like um, our horse, there's another horse that really likes our mare, and if you take them apart, she'll sit there, the other horse, there's another mare, will sit there and call and call and call until she comes back. So they get connected to just like people. That must uh, help you with some storylines. <laughs> it can, yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting, especially for children's books. I would think that writing children's books it would almost be a given that you'd have to have an animal in there. Is that how I you think so? Think? Yeah, I would think Although so. I, I've got two of the books I've written. Well, I guess one doesn't have the dog in it. Um, I wrote a sequel to it that did have the dog in it. Um, just because I think it's important. I, the, just the connection, especially with a horse book. Kids and horses, they develop, and even as adults, we develop a, a connection with that animal. Um, that I, I just I it's so important and um yeah I don't know I just like I like to have them well and so many children adore animals mm -hmm. they, yeah. they just adore animals I mean even if they have no experience with them you know just just seeing them seeing the pictures in the books uh it it attracts their eyes it's something they're yeah. not you know, a horse, like, I, I have a, a, a young granddaughter. Well, she's never seen a horse in real life. But if she would see a horse in a book, she, you know, she would be excited by that because it's something new, it's something different, it catches their eye. I would think it would be, in my in my mind, it would be a given that you would have to have an animal. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I would, <laughs> I would think too for Jamie for for the exotic animals too. That would be very interesting for a children's book. I've never written yeah. children's book, so yeah, I have a few things that I play with. My I have a two year old, so um, I live and breathe picture books all day, every day. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I might be on your horizon, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I just read a really <laughs> cute uh, one that was about a a, a gibbon that had gotten lost in the jungle. And so he met up with all these friends to help him find his way back to his tree. Oh, <laughs> yeah. One of my my son knows all of his animals from from books, so he's he's yeah. obsessed with books. Um, and yeah, I think that there's maybe one out of his 
dozens upon dozens of books that don't have an animal in it. So I agree. I think that it's a nice thing to have kind of a requirement in, yeah. in kids' books. Yeah, for sure. One of the things I remember most from my way back, I mean, this is way back for me, my first grade reader had a monkey, it was Winky. And I don't remember the human characters, but I remember Winky. Yeah. But it's true. Yeah, you would you would remember those. Uh, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question for Jamie. I'm curious uh, what you have coming up because this you, you have your debut novel in the, in the can. Uh, are you planning a series in the, in the rainforest, or are you going to um, focus to a zoo, or are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one is a standalone, um, but it has the potential to have others in it. Uh, should I go that route? I have a few different things that I'm playing with, um, all of which have animals involved in it. Um, a fellow author friend of mine made a joke about making a zoo story in space. I just um, had a anthology published with a story in it uh, that was a space zoology oceanography type story. So um, we made a joke about doing a zoo, zoo colony in space thriller. Um, so now I've gone the science fiction route uh, playing with that a little bit. Um, that would be yeah. interesting everything is is animal related so no matter what i do next uh i've got about three works in progress uh <laughs> you might with science. dolphin country too i mean you could do a lot with dolphins yeah they we say have just everything here mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the manatees that would make a great book i mean people used to think they were mermaids looking at them it's a little hard to, to figure how anybody <laughs> thought they were a mermaid but they're still an interesting animal oh for sure yeah, so no matter what I do next, there's definitely animals involved somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got a lot of potential there. Yes, yeah, to say the least. A lot to work with. Good. Yeah. On the sci-fi side, uh, if you don't mind, mind uh, tossing out an idea, sentry ships that are carrying bio re representative bioregions because the complexity of life is just too, too much. And you need to have these basically seeds to plant on the planet that you're colonizing. And, you know, the zookeeper there, the naturalist there is going to be uh, king for trying to keep the biosphere operational. Uh, there's been some work done on that, but not anything that's been done, I think, with enough of a zoological focus. Yeah, that's my, my thought was uh, kind of like genetic piracy type of a thing where they're trying to conserve the the species and so they're kind of colonizing different planets uh to keep these arcs alive um and propagating and and so yeah having that genetic cyber side of it of, of theft and destruction of endangered species and and things like that but yeah all just ideas intriguing <laughs> Hurry up and write it. We want to read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting point, too, with that. Uh, the next book I'm thinking, I haven't decided if I'm going to do it, but each of my characters, my books, have some sort of different, the one I'm doing now has an art theft, which I'm learning a lot about art. But I'm thinking my next one, to have somebody working with this exotic, exotic animal smuggling, you know, the bad guys trying to smuggle animals in and, and you know, or, of course, people getting killed in the process. I haven't gotten into whether I really am going to do that one or not, but I think that would be an interesting line to follow because, you know, you read some really weird stuff with these horrible things people try to do to bring in animals. Yep, the latest, I don't know if prevalent. any of you read Carl Hyacin, but Carl Hyacin is doing in his latest book, Squeeze Me, and you have to have a very dark sense of humor. You probably need to live in Florida to appreciate Carl Hyacin. <laughs> But anyway, in Squeeze Me, he's having, because of the environment change and climate change, the pythons moving down into West Palm Beach where his fictional president, uh, who he doesn't show in a very good light, lives. But I don't know if any of you have read Carl Hyacin. Mm -hmm. You really need to. <laughs> he's a very interesting guy, especially you, Jamie. I'll Jamie, have to look you him would, up for you sure. would yeah. appreciate him. But uh, he, uh, he's. He's an environmentalist. He's very much against, you know, overdeveloping the Everglades and killing off all of our wildlife. And um, 
he's very, very dark sense of humor. He uses a lot of animals in his books. Not always in a good way, though. But he has one scene where he has a, a, all of these tourists are coming and throwing trash on the highways and things like that. And uh, this guy, which isn't really such a bad guy, he kidnaps one of the women and uh, he's going to throw her in the pond in the Everglades with the alligators. And she said, but please, sir, I don't know how to swim. And he said, it's okay, the alligators can't play bridge. That's his typical <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> but, well, we're kind of getting to the point where we need to wind down and it's been a great panel and I've enjoyed hearing all the different points of view. Anybody have any final ideas they'd like to throw out? Maybe suggestions to authors who are thinking of writing and want to put animals in their books. I agree with like what everything. Oh, I'm sorry. You can go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I agree with everything uh, that was said earlier. It's like, don't anthropomorphize, um, you know, stay true to an animal, natural history and, and nature. And it, it makes all the difference when something comes across as authentic. Because for me, when I'm reading and there's an animal in a book, I immediately have that animal behavior mindset. And so if it's something that's completely unrealistic, odds are it's going to ruin the book for me, or at least make it to where it's not something I would read again or recommend to somebody. Um, so I agree, staying true to, you know, what you're writing and, and how the animals behave is just as important as the character itself. They're a part of your uh, book. Any other ideas? As in all forms of writing, encyclopedias, documentaries, these are your friends. Before you even start, write the first word. Once you have your concept, do some basic research. You don't have to be a doctorate in it, but you should have it so that in the broad, stro broad strokes, you're not doing something really stupid. Yeah, good point. AJ? Oh, I have nothing further to add. I, I'm really uh, happy that I was on this panel today and I, I got to meet all of you and, and learn about, we have quite a variety of, of even though some of us write mysteries, mysteries or, or oh, some, all different. have some form of mystery in our books, uh, you know, we, we fit into different genres and we have the, the children's author and so I think it was a, it was a great panel, and we had a nice variety of opinions and uh, and insights. I'm very uh, very happy. Ray, agreed. No, I I agree with with all of it. You know, just especially you know uh, what Stephen said about um, going and and doing your research. And I know I spent a lot of time listening to my daughter's trainer because you know even. Um, certain words that go along with horseback riding and things like that are mm -hmm. make the book more authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, and if somebody it's, who's it's, a writer knows these words and you're not using them correctly, they're going to pick right. up on them in a minute. Yeah. That's in any field. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. it has been a great panel and I've appreciated all of your participation. I, I, we hopefully we will be on live on there. If we haven't, I'll get with Richie and see if he can put us on there. And hopefully it will help us all with our books. And let's see, Jamie, yours is just coming out, right? Yep, pre-orders. I'm submitting it all this weekend. So pre-orders should be in the next uh, week or so. So yeah. Yay. Yeah. 